Okay. Yes, start na. It's past 3. 30. Oh, Ang hapon <laughs> sa atin, good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, also, magandang hapon po sa mga kasama natin na nasa YouTube ngayon. Uh, may I request you, those who are here in Zoom, if you can kindly turn on your videos, kahit mabilis lang, two seconds lang, so we could greet each other. Ayan. Thank you po. <laughs> Ay, ate. Ayan. What a joy to see your faces, kahit na virtual lamang. Ayan. Kasi somewhere I read na ano, we as humans are wired to respond positively to faces, human faces. So, notice na medyo, di ba, nagkakaroon ng joy, bigla sa puso kapag nakita ka ng mukha. Lalo na yung mga mukha ng kaibigan <laughs> at familiar sa'yo. So, thank you for allowing me to see you <laughs> sa inyong video. And welcome to the Diliman Campus Bible Church. Let me just read quickly our mission statement. DCBC is a church in UP Diliman committed to obeying both the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Our Jerusalem consists of the students, faculty, and staff of UP Diliman and the communities in and around the campus. Our vision, by God's enabling, DCBC will be a praying, worshiping, evangelizing, biblically taught, and loving fellowship of believers, and by His grace, a growing church for His glory that reaches out to others in the community, serves the needy, and sends out its members to other parts of the Philippines and to the ends of the earth. One of DCBC's core values is being prayerful, as you can see, the third core value. So we aspire to be how Acts 2.42 describes the believers. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. One of our deacons, Kuyo Arvin Alfonso, will lead us in our congregational prayer. Uh, wait lang po uh, ang prayer po natin is uh, going to be recording oops Kuya, Sir Nico can you allow me to ano, share uh, stop nyo po yung sharing Sir Nico ayan okay wait lang po Sorry. Yeah, this is Kuya Arvin po sharing. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. We lift up to you in prayers our country's national leadership from all branches of our government. In this time, we pray for the executive, legislative, and judiciary branch. We pray for selfless leadership and righteous governance in our country that it would be prevalent in the leaders of our land. You have commanded us, Lord, to pray for all people especially kings and all who are in high positions. So we ask you to grant strong and reassuring leadership arising from the office of the President. We pray that President Duterte will continue to acknowledge his need for God's wisdom and direction as he leads our country in these very trying times. We also remember our Kababayans who have been greatly affected by the aftermath of Typhoon Roli. We pray for their physical, emotional, mental, and economic recovery. We pray for rapid and organized relief operations to bring aid to those areas struck hardest by the typhoon. 
We pray for Catanduanes, Albay, Cabarines Sur, and parts of Calabarzon, and also Mindoro. We pray for immediate restoration of power, communication lines in these areas. Likewise, we ask that immediate access be restored so clean water will be made available for drinking and cooking for the people there. Strengthen, O Lord, the hearts of the provincial governors and local mayors of these areas. As our country reels from the pandemic that has resulted in losses in life and jobs, we pray for unity and collaboration among all Filipinos in the fight against COVID-19. We pray that we will do our part in complying with the strict health protocols and safety measures being implemented in the community level. We remember to pray for safety and strength for our frontliners in the hospitals as they look after patients. We also pray for wisdom and humility for the IATF and NTF as they continue to revisit policies, regulations aimed to help battle the pandemic while working towards helping affected sectors of the economy to recover. We pray for the education sector. As most schools have reopened and the month has passed since the school year has started, there are several birth pains, glitches, and adjustments for both the students and the teachers. Bless the teachers, school administrators, as they seek to teach in this challenging setup. We pray for private sector in partnership with the government as the telecommunication companies seek to fast-track the improvement of internet connectivity, which is very vital in these times. We pray for the body of Christ, that amidst an atmosphere of fear and certainty, will be a source of encouragement and strength, even as we abide in Jesus. We give back to you the praise, honor, and thanksgiving for the recently concluded online family camp. We thank you for your word that was proclaimed and studied all throughout the four days. We thank you for the humble leadership of Pao and the rest of the camp staff who have all worked together for the furtherance of your kingdom, O Lord, through the building up of your people in the CBC. As in the church camp's theme, Tanglao, may we radiate the light we have through Jesus in our homes, in our communities, and in our workplaces. We pray for the upcoming nomination and election of DCBC's elders and deacons. May the clarion call to lead and serve be clear in the hearts of those who will be called. Still their hearts, O Lord, and let them heed the Holy Spirit's leading. We also lift up to you some of our brethren in the afternoon service with specific concerns and requests. We pray for healing for the parents of Wiz and also Dang Commendador who has been tested positive for COVID-19. We also pray for protection and for favor favorable results in the swab test for Wiz and his sister. We also lift up to you Lorraine's mom that she may recover and be able to go home as well. This afternoon, we once again pause and remember to pray for the persecuted church in Tunisia. We pray for converts who have lost their jobs and unable to attend school after their faith was discovered. We pray that the Lord will supply their needs. And we pray that they may fully trust in you, O Lord, in this time. We pray for supernatural strength and grace for the believers in Tunisia as they endeavor to show Christ's love to their family members that persecutes them. As they seek to let the light they have in Jesus shine, we pray that God will turn their families' hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And lastly, we pray for opportunities for fellowship to be opened up among Tunisian Christians in these times. We commit to you, O Lord, this afternoon's worship. We express our gratitude to you, O Lord, for providing us means to see and hear each other so we may worship together as one community. We pray for your messenger, Pastor Armin, as he delivers the message this afternoon. Use him powerfully as your mouthpiece. To proclaim your word. As we come together as a community, may our offering of praise, worship, and fellowship be a pleasing and sweet aroma to you. All this we pray 
in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for this opportunity to come together in prayer. Thank you so much, our uh, thank you so much, Kuya Arvin, and thank you, Pao, for helping. So now let's continue to prepare our hearts as we approach God's throne of grace this afternoon in in congregational worship. Let me read one of the more popular psalms, Psalm 23, but this time I will read it. I will read the Passion Translation. So it's one translation I just discovered this year. Let's allow ourselves to meditate on each word, each truth about God and ourselves, our relationship with Him, and our dependence on Him. Psalm 23. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks takes me, take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. Takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, I return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are our shepherd, and we are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you because you know each of us, our needs, our strengths, our weaknesses, and you deal with us with grace and love. You know when we stray, and you know just how to rescue us. You carry us back to your fold, and you, though you discipline us, we know that it is for our good. Thank you because you do not give up on us. You search for us and you gently rebuke and guide us. We come before you today, gathered as your flock, aware of our filthiness, our unfaithfulness, our unworthiness. We humbly come before you, our King, our God, our Shepherd, with contrite hearts, knowing that you are compassionate and gracious and you are able to cleanse us and give us pure hearts. Allow us to offer ourselves to you wholly. Allow us to meditate on your word, your character, to declare your praise, sing with humble and joyful hearts before you because you've done so much. You are worthy, O oh Lord. You alone are worthy of our praise, our worship, our devotion. These we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 95 verses 1 to 3 says, Come everyone, let's sing for joy to the Lord. Let's shout our loudest praises to our God who saved us. Everyone come, meet his face with a thankful heart. Don't hold back your praises. Make him great by your shouts of joy. For the Lord is the greatest of all, King God over all other gods. Let's now call our brother Nico to lead us in the singing. Okay. Thank you, Atisa. I will also ask Pao to help me uh, flash the lyrics for our praise and worship this afternoon. Make Thank him great you. by As your in the shouts church of joy. Caps theme For the Talao, Lord is the greatest of may all. We King God light. We have over all Jesus. Jesus. Our homes. Yung ano, computer sound. Thank you. Uh, so, habang uh, 
na nagse-set up yung ating lyrics. Um, hahabaan ko na lang yung kwento ko para umabot. So, since bata ako, joke lang. <laughs> um, isa sa mga napanood ko po nitong kasi simula lang ng, nung nagsisimula pa lang po yung pandemic, isa sa mga series na pinanood ko ay yung The Chosen. Nasa ano siya? Nasa YouTube. Tapos meron din siyang app. And then, um, it's about uh, it's about the life of Christ pero seen through um, the people who were following Him. Maganda siya. Uh, uh, and dun sa first episode, meron pong isang character, hindi ko na sasabihin kung sino, may isang character po doon na laging may pinagdadaanan na trial. And yung isa sa mga early scenes was that character trying to remember what his father taught him, a verse that his father made him made her remember. And that verse was Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 3. So isi-share ko na lang din sa inyo yung verses na yun. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Um, This is so true even in our lives right now where there are so many things happening. Whenever I am asked to lead um, uh, worship and singing, ang lagi lang nasa isip ko is we have to acknowledge the fact that there are so many things happening. But at the same time, we must always remember that it is more important to acknowledge who our God is. In this verse, uh, sabi sa atin that God is our Savior. That is true. And even during this time, He holds our hands and makes sure that and makes sure that we are safe. Um, hindi man sa physical na sakit alam natin na prone pa rin tayo na magkasakit, but our souls, our salvation is secure in Him. So let us use this time to uh, remember all the works of the Lord, to remember His goodness, to remember His awesome characteristics, to remember that He alone is worthy to be praised, that He is our Rock, that He is our Redeemer. And ultimately, He is the Savior of our souls. So please join me, if you can, uh, while we sing our first song, O Lord, My Rock and My Redeemer. Sorrow has my joy. 
gracious Savior of my ruined life, by guilt and cross laid on your shoulders, in my place you suffered, bled, and died. You rose the grave. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. During times like these, it is only the Christian who can rejoice. It is the, only the Christian who has the joy and the hope to persevere because only we have God. He is our Father. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Master. And He is ours. He has given Himself to us so that in Him we may recognize and we may have all the advantages of being considered a child of God. Let us sing our next two songs, na magkasunod, Christ is mine forevermore and come thou fount. Mine are days that God is not.
Let's pray. Dear Father, we praise you because you are the God who is above all our circumstances. You are sovereign above our lives, about the events that are currently happening. You are the one who consistently provides for us, overwhelmingly loves us, shows us his kindness and mercy, even through the toughest times. You are our strength and our unquenchable source of hope. Help us, Lord, to focus for the rest of our service. May you bless us, Lord, uh, with your message and with the reading of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you so much, Brother Nico, for leading us. Indeed, may all our days bring glory to his name. Our treasure is Christ, and what a gift that he is ours forevermore. Our God is our Ebenezer, our rock of help. Let, his, let the remembrance of his grace, his goodness, sacrifice like a fetter bind our hearts to him. For our scripture reading, kindly open your Bibles to the first chapter, uh, to the fifth chapter of Timothy, of First Timothy. We will read the whole chapter five plus the first two verses of chapter six. With your microphones on mute, kindly read aloud. Follow along as um, I read the passage. First Timothy five one to twenty five. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Honor with uh, widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Verse four, verse five. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busy bodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. But the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Let all, I'll read until verse 2 of chapter 6. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. May the Lord be blessed by the reading of his word. 
Our message this afternoon is entitled, Love the Flock. And this will be delivered to us by our pastor, Pastor Armin Alforte. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sa. Um, after the wonderful experience we all had at our first ever and hopefully only online DCBC family church camp, we now resume our sermon series on the Apostle Paul's first letter to his spiritual son and appointed pastor of the church in Ephesus, Timothy. And by the way, I hope you all truly had a wonderful, refreshing and edifying experience at the camp. So maybe we can just all uh, unmute our mics just for a few seconds and let us all give a clap offering to our sovereign God to whom nothing is impossible and who tirelessly works for the good of all those who love and obey him. Let us all give a clap offering. Okay, thank you. You may now uh, mute again your mics. Before we proceed further, let us commit this time to our Lord and seek his guidance in the study of his word. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we come together as a congregation to study your word and to hear your message for us this afternoon. Father, we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us, that all our hearts and minds will be open to your word, to your message, to your commands, and to obedience to what you want of us all. Father, use your messenger today, and may your words be heard clearly and powerfully for everyone in the congregation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In our previous sermons in this series on 1 Timothy, I emphasized the need to have a good understanding or exegesis of the context in which this letter of Paul was written. And so we considered such things as the nature of the letter, the relationship between the author and the recipient, and the conditions and situation in Ephesus that necessitated the writing of the letter in the first place. Today, I would like you to consider as part of understanding what Paul has written in addition to context, the tone of his letter. We have to remember that the written word, aside from actual speech, was the main form of communication in Paul's time. Live oral and video broadcasts obviously had not yet been invented then, much less audio and video recordings. Illustrated writings may have already existed then in some parts of the world, and certainly hieroglyphics, cuneiform, and other pictographic forms of writing. But emojis, GIFs, and other visual aids to communication that we so take for granted and use liberally in our day-to-day -day communications now would have been practically unimaginable then. And yet, the need to communicate not just plain meanings, but also feelings and emotions was just as well felt then as it is now. We must remember that practically all letters that were written were also meant to be read aloud to a larger audience. And this is where the tone of the writing plays a role in communication. Imagine, if you will, the first letter from Paul to Timothy as having a voice. What would the tone of that voice be? And what would that tone communicate? 
If you can recall some earlier words and phrases in this letter, Paul used words like urge and charge and command, all in an imperative and active tone. He gave stern warnings and instructions, and especially in chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, Paul expressed an urgency in the need for Timothy to implement his instructions at once and not wait for Paul himself to arrive in Ephesus. In the chapter previous to our passage for today, chapter 4, Paul continued to use this urgent and stern tone, even though his words were more personally directed to Timothy himself. And I read, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Chapter 4, verse 7. And command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. Chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. As we study today's passage, I would like you all to recognize a shift in Paul's tone and its effect on what he is saying to Timothy. Let us now look at the passage. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 2. For our purposes today, I have divided the passage into four parts. First part, encouraging others. Uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Second part, honoring widows, chapter 5, verses 3 to 16. And ver, uh, the part three is honoring elders, chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. And the fourth part is honoring masters, chapter, two, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Let's look into our uh, passage for today. I want to read the first two verses. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. In our very first verse, Paul tells Timothy, do not rebuke, but instead encourage. Practically, all the people in the congregation. The manner in which he is to do this is by treating everyone as direct members of his own family. And so, he is to consider all older men as his father, all younger men as his brothers, all older women as his mother, and all younger women as his sisters. This need to encourage, instead of rebuking the members of the church, gives us a better sense of the state of affairs in the church of Ephesus. And it is not a very good picture. Understandably, the false teaching being propagated in the church by those in leadership, coupled with a bickering and infighting among them, with hints that some of it is related to money matters, with result to demoralization among the members. The scandalous behavior of many women who were improperly discipled could have only exacerbated the situation. The last thing that the ordinary church member needed would be to be rebuked by an outsider sent in to fix things for actions not of their doing and over which they had no control. And so we see here how sensitive the Apostle Paul is to the ordinary regular members of the Ephesian church and that what they needed was not, again, to be rebuked, but rather 
to be encouraged, to remain in the faith, to continue to look towards God and to our Lord Jesus Christ for their guidance and for their hope. At the end of verse two, Paul adds a qualifier to his instruction to Timothy. He must encourage the congregation in all purity. Timothy should have no ulterior or personal motives in doing this, in encouraging them and in not rebuking them. He must always be above reproach as was mentioned earlier in the qualities and qualifications for elders. He must be above reproach in his dealings with all members of the congregation. Now, after these first two verses, Paul again reverts to what he did earlier, addressing specific individuals or specific groups in the church. And here in our passage for today, he addresses the concerns of the women, the elders, and the bond servants. In terms of, well, we, we now come to our second part of our passage, uh, verses three to 16 of chapter five. And we note right from the outset that here, Paul allots a huge amount of words of his writing to the concerns of the women members of the church. Although he specifically addresses widows, both the older widows as well as the younger widows, we can see that this is actually intended for the women of the church. In verse three, the apostle Paul states, honor widows who are truly widows. With this statement, Paul brings to the forefront for front the plight of what he calls truly widows. For us to appreciate this uh, uh, raising of this concern, we have to understand that the congregation in Ephesus is mostly Gentile. Now, we do not have uh, you know, actual knowledge or evidence of the situation of women in general in the society at large in the city of Ephesus at that time. But we do know that by and large in the Roman Empire during those times, women uh, were relegated to a second class status. Uh, for, for in many areas of day-to-day uh, -day living, they did not have the same advantages, they did not have the same rights, and they did not have the same considerations as women, and to some extent even, they were not even equal to their own male children. However, for the Jews, for those who are knowledgeable about the Mosaic law, we, we understand that God in his wisdom had provided for all those who are marginalized in society. Mosaic laws provided for the vulnerable, marginalized, and oppressed. And this provision in actual law was unheard of in the ancient world. 
and in particular among the Romanized Gentile cultures during the time of Jesus and of Paul. You may recall that uh, in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy, there were extensive uh, number of laws that applied specifically to the care for all these marginalized people and among them were widows. In addition to that, there were even um, uh, provisions for the inheritance of property as well as the uh, bestowing of property from women to their descendants, which again was mostly unheard of in ancient times, women uh, acquiring and owning property. We recall also from the book of Ruth, how uh, the concept of a kinsman redeemer was used and was actively um, uh, inculcated in, in the Israelite society so that women who were disadvantaged, those who became widowed and had no other means of support, were allowed to be uh, redeemed by a kinsman and uh, given the opportunity to become a part of a larger family. So specific provisions for women, especially widows, were part of the law and gave them protection. Thus, in the absence of any, as part of the concept of a new life in Christ, Paul gave specific guidelines to Timothy to implement in the Ephesian church, a practical application of Christ's new command for Christians to love one another. If you may recall in the book of Acts, soon after the, the church in Jerusalem was established, the problem of uh, the feeding of the widows of the um, Greek Jews or the Hellen Hellenistic Jews came up. And so the church uh, created, officially created the office of the deacon so that the widows could be served properly what was due them. So this was a continuation of the, the uh, mosaic laws in which the widows were protected and cared for by the community. Now, again, this was in Jerusalem. This did not, the, the people in Ephesus most uh, and, and most of all the uh, new Christians who were of a Gentile background did not have this kind of um, uh, social uh, nets okay, that, that would uh, allow for the caring of these people. And so here we see that Paul had to give very specific and uh, and uh, meticulous guidance to Timothy as to who should constitute a widow, who would be uh, enrolled as a widow, and who uh, the other members of the church, uh, especially the relatives, would be responsible for. So that uh, only the true widows will be taken care of by the church. And thus, this is a wise allocation of church resources. Now, against the context is that there were no existing provisions in the general society and were applicable mainly. And these, these uh, provisions and these instructions were applicable mainly to the church in Ephesus. And these included 
uh, provisions that those with relatives should be supported by their families. That's in verse four and verse 16. And that those without families should be supported by the church. And you see this in verse nine, as well as in verse 16. Now, after addressing the question of the older uh, widows, Paul turned his attention to the younger widows. And his instruction was, he recommends that they should remarry. Now, this might seem a little strange or uh, something that is not for or that is quite foreign to us that it should be actually spelled out that they should remarry. However, we have to imagine again ourselves in the shoes of the Ephesian church. We do not again know specifically how the society uh, treated young women who lost their husbands. But here, Paul is actively uh, encouraging remarriage among the young widows. Essentially, he is saying that for women who became widows, it is acceptable. It's not only acceptable, but it is to be considered a positive option for the young women to again become secure in life, to contribute children to the community, and to exercise management and productive skills in place of idleness and gossip, which gives the enemy opportunity to create dissension and damage within the church. And so here again, we see the perceptiveness and sensitivity of the Apostle Paul to the situation in the church of Ephesus and what and the dangerous situation that comes about when uh, women are not given opportunities to be productive and to, be co to contribute to the life of the church. This view of, uh, of, or this appreciation of Paul probably runs counter to the uh, feminist uh, view of Paul. In the, um, in the debate or in the discussion within the church between uh, feminism and the role of women and uh, the role of men, often Paul is viewed as a uh, patriarchal uh, male chauvinist. But we can see here that actually Paul uh, shows that his uh, awareness and his knowledge of the Mosaic law and his appreciation for how the marginalized and the oppressed uh, uh, sectors of the society are given uh, opportunities to be cared for by the community at large and also for their treatment as uh, respected members of the society. So I think it, uh, my own personal view is that uh, much of this uh, negative view of Paul's attitude towards women is uh, really misplaced and does not uh, truly understand uh, what he has written and for what reason he had written those things. Let's now proceed to the uh, third part of our passage, honoring elders versus 17 to 25. And here, uh, Paul 
addresses the other side of the coin, so to speak. Uh, if you will recall, uh, Paul was very vehement in his denunciation of the elders who had been the source of false teachings in the church. And so he's, here we see that he is conscious and he's aware that not all the elders of the church were guilty of false teaching. And that uh, the fact that these elders who were false teachers had given a bad name to, to the leadership and that included even those who were not guilty and who in fact may have been doing a very creditable job. This could have been a very discouraging thing for the leadership of the church. And so Paul takes this opportunity now to, uh, to single out the elders. And in fact, he says very clearly that those who did their work well should be considered worthy of double honor. Okay. So he stressed the need to reassure those who perform their duties and responsibilities commendably and that they should be compensated accordingly. But this does not mean that the elders would still be above being uh, charged or rebuked or accused of wrongdoing. And so he made it clear that if an elder was to be uh, charged for some kind of sin, then they must also be protected against unjust and malicious charges. And to do this, he insisted that there be uh, more, uh, more than one person. There has to be an evidence of at least two or maybe three witnesses. Okay. So Timothy had to always be fair and impartial in meeting out justice within the church. Now, um, after this, right, right after this, uh, this instruction to, to Timothy on how to uh, dispense justice, especially uh, cases against the elders, uh, Paul gives again, a very personal instruction to Timothy. He says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. This is verse 22. Here, Paul is a, uh, warning or cautioning Timothy against being hasty in dispensing the blessings of his office on others. This is the laying on of hands where using his office as the pastor, he then appoints or blesses others to different positions in the church, and particularly uh, positions of leadership like uh, elders. So he must always be fair and impartial, not only in meeting out justice, but he has also to exercise caution when uh, appointing officers and officials of the church. And as he said, as Paul instructed him not to take part in the sins of others, keep yourself pure 
which is a reiteration of the uh, the uh, his his instruction in verse two of doing things, encouraging things in all purity, meaning again, Timothy must always be above reproach in everything he does. Now, this verse 22 is followed by verse 23, which the ESV puts in a parenthesis. Okay, so it's a parenthetical uh, admonition to Timothy. And here we see this uh, fairly uh, well-known verse, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Here we get another glimpse of the special bond and relationship that Paul had with Timothy. It is the father-son relationship. And I'm sure many of us can relate how one or both of our parents will express their concern for our health, for our well-being by dispensing medical advice. I'm sure many of you, and I, I know I have, been the recipient of such advice from my own parents. And this is done out of love. This is done out of care, out of the parent-child relationships. And here again, we take note of the difference in tone of this, this section of the letter. So after this words of instruction about how to honor the elders as a whole, we now come to the last part, the fourth part, honoring masters. This is actually uh, addressed to the bond servants. And um, th that's the term that's used in the, the ESV, bond servants. Other translations use the word slaves. Uh, in essence, though, a bond servant is a person who is obligated to uh, perform service to another person. Uh, but this service, the person can be relieved of by the purchase of his freedom. Okay, so a bond servant can either buy his freedom or he can serve up to a certain point until his debt to that person is paid so, or he has paid for his bondage. Okay, uh, so uh, apparently, uh, this was the prevailing custom and practice in Ephesus at that time. And I think this is also part of the Greek culture where uh, people would, uh, uh, you know, uh, who get indebted to others and are unable to pay, then become their bond servants. And here, Paul is, um, again, sensitive to the plight of the bond servant in uh, continuing to serve a master who may or may not be good. Okay? The master may be cruel. The master may uh, be um, uh, always um, uh, asking for the service of the bond servant in ways that are unjust. Okay, so the, the, the complaint or the condition of the bond servant, those who have already accepted Christ as their savior and their expectation is to be uh, 
uh, freed of all this uh, uh, slavery or enslavement. Here, Paul admonishes them to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. And this is not just so that uh, they will be uh, treated properly because so for some, that treatment will not come at all. But because they, having accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, now have acquired the name of God. And the, the reputation and the character of God is now at stake if they are not obedient to their masters. Now in verse two, Paul says that those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on a different, for a different reason. Not just that they are now uh, carrying the name of God, but that in fact, their master is also their brother. And again, they must be served all the better since those who benefit from that service are their brothers in Christ. As Paul says, they are believers and beloved. Again, this is a practical application of Christ's second command. Love one another as I have loved you. Okay. So, bond servants, regardless of how they may be treated by their masters, they should still honor them. And that if their masters are believing masters, they should be uh, treated as brothers or considered as brothers because they are believers and beloved. As I mentioned earlier, there has now been a shift in the tone of Paul. When he considers the church as a whole, when he considers the plight of the ordinary uh, members of the uh, congregation, when he considers the plight of the marginalized uh, and uh, those who are, have no other means of support except the church, and when he considers the plight of the elders who have done nothing wrong and yet who are actually contributing and doing their work well, we see that not all is fire and brimstone for Paul. Paul has his sensitive, Paul has his understanding and caring side that we must also acknowledge as we read the words that Paul has written under different conditions throughout his ministry. And so even as he wrote letters to people while in prison or while under duress, under harassment, suffering all kinds of uh, difficulties in his life, he still uh, embodies the character and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here in this passage that we consider today that there was a definite shift from stern rebuke to encouraging recognition of the status as every believer, as a child of God. The pastoral concern 
with which Paul instructed Timothy is evident. His mentorship of Timothy in applying Christ's command for believers to love one another, especially for those responsible for shepherding the flock like Timothy, is in full display in these verses. Of particular concern for Paul are the groups that he identified as needing special attention in the Ephesian church. Again, we note that Paul's um, understanding of the situation in the church gives him this authority and gives him this ability to identify particular individuals, particular groups. And so these instructions are given with those particular concerns in mind. And so we have to be very careful when we try to extract lessons from these letters and apply them to our lives and our conditions in our world today. I'm not saying that they don't apply, but I'm just saying that we have to be careful, noting that these were given for very particular occasions and situations during those times. If the conditions were different, he might have given different instructions at this point in his letter. And so if the, the impact of false teaching and the impact on uh, false leaders would have been different, then maybe he wouldn't have said anything about the condition of the elders. And the same could be true about the uh, women, the widows, the young widows who were gossips and idlers. If this were not the situation at the, in the church in Ephesus, he might have paid attention to other uh, details of the church at that time. In general, though, our passage for today instructed Timothy on how he should approach his responsibility as a pastor. And this role as a pastor is epitomized in Psalm 23, which was uh, read to us earlier by their worship leader. And this is also a role that was incarnated by Christ himself. And again, it's summarized in the second command that Christ gave to his disciples. Love one another as I have loved you. In conclusion, our takeaway today from our study of 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses verse 1 to chapter 6 verse 2 is this. A pastor is to love the flock entrusted to him by God because all believers are beloved by God. God bless our study of his word this afternoon. Thank you so much, Pastor Armin, for the message this afternoon. Let us spend a few moments in silence as we reflect on the truths that we have heard today.
Let us continue to worship the Lord through the giving of our gifts. Allow me to read uh, this passage where Jesus, um, so that we uh, let's listen to how Jesus um, explained to his disciples what giving or how giving should be. Then he sat down near the offering box, watching all the people dropping in their coins. Many of the rich would put in very large sums, but a destitute widow walked up and dropped in two small copper coins worth less than a penny. Jesus called his disciples to gather around and then said to them, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given a larger offering than any of the wealthy, for the rich only gave out of their surplus, but she sacrificed out of her poverty and gave to God all that she had to live on which was everything she had. That's from Mark 12, 41 to 44. Whatever our circumstances these days, whether we are in need or we have plenty, may we seek to give our gifts with the right attitude of humility and gratitude to our giver. Since we are not able to meet physically, we may just set aside our gifts or we may opt to deposit them to the Diliman Campus Bible Church's bank account which we will flash right now. Or maybe later during the announcements. Later na lang po. <laughs> Thank you. So whatever our choice is, let's uh, commit these gifts to the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you never fail to provide for us in every way. As if it's not enough that you have given us the greatest gift, your Son, Jesus Christ, you make sure that we have all we need each day. We have food on our table, clothes on our backs, our shelters to keep us safe, warm, and dry. Thank you because we need not worry about our future because you hold us in your hands. Thank you that you have placed us in this church where we could look out for those who are in need and we could extend your grace and love through our giving. Thank you for our leaders tasked to administer these gifts. Continue to give them the wisdom that they need as, as they apportion our offerings. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So right now, this juncture, we will be assigned by, by our tech team into small groups. Konti lang po tayo, no? Anim lang po tayo. <laughs> so, tama ba? Dalawang grupo na lang ba ito? Oh. Ayan. We'll have the opportunity to share what, um, how the Lord dealt with us through this message. So, kindly make sure to close the session in prayer dahil tatlo na lang naman tayo sa small group. We have how many minutes po? Ten? Uh, pwede po. Pwede pong ten. Okay po. Ten minutes to share our realizations and then close in prayer Thank you. Please okay. wait, lang for, wait for the tech team to assign us. We would all be lost. We would all have no hope. But because you have loved us first, we are then called to love you also and to love one another as Christ has loved us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Yes. 
Thank you so much, Nico and Kuya Armin. Let's now proceed to our announcements this week. We thank the Lord for Nico who's serving as our song leader and tech team for today. It's a stress. I think this is it. Ayan. Okay, so um, we joyfully celebrate the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ today, November 8th. Luther is celebrating his birthday. So, siya po si Luther. He used to attend the PM service. And on uh, tomorrow, Ate Belen Ortega will celebrate her birthday. Si Jaire on the, on the 10th. And si Jaire po yung apo ni... Ah, tama ba? Apo ba siya ni Ate Ed? Magpamangkin. <laughs> Kalimutan ko po. Si Prof. Zarco will celebrate his birthday also on the 10th. And then Ate Jenny Marimat, mom of Giselle and Janelle, tama po, on the 12th. And Tita Pilar Kiwa on the 12th. So let, subukan po natin silang batiin sa kanilang mga special na araw. Uh, magdiriwang din ang kanilang anibersaryo ng kasal, sina Kuya Tony at Ate Loli Francisco. Wow, 11-11, kasabay na. 11-11. Ayan. So, yung kanina po, uh, we offered to the Lord our uh, gifts, no? Pero virtual lamang. Pero you can deposit to DCBC PNB Savings Account 1083-7000-4083. Ayan po. Tuloy-tuloy po ang ating mga prayer meeting. Uh, tuwing Sabado, merong... 8 o'clock ng umaga at merong 8 o'clock ng gabi. Ako po ay masayang nakakadalo nung pang umaga. Pero hindi pala ako nakadalo nung previous Saturdays dahil merong school event. Pero yun po, nakaka-bless kong sumama sa panalangin kasama ang kapatiran. Ito pa rin ang ating meeting ID at password. Tapos po, ay sorry. Yung sa mga Zoom room, kindly coordinate with Jack and Kuya Rex kapag may kailangan, kung gusto nyong gumamit ng ating premium account sa Zoom. Kasi pala, late ko na na-discover na pag hindi pala premium account ay 40 minutes lang pwede. So, so kung kailangan po natin ng mahaba-habang oras. DCBC elections on the 13th of December, Sunday, please pray and consider people to nominate. We may elect four nominees for elders and four nominees for deacons. Please send your nominations to Kuya Glenn. Continuing, ibig sabihin isa pang taon, no? yung nasa unang row, tapos outgoing. Pero pwede pa rin natin silang inominate ulit. Sina Kuya Ken, Kuya Manny, Kuya Rex, Ate Nam, Kuya Arvin, at si Poy. Oh, ayan. Meron tayong may special offer mula sa voice, ang kanilang devotional na pamagat ay siya ay sundan. Devotional sa pagunita ng ikalabing walong taon ng Voice Philippines. Ito ay 100 pesos na lang kung kayo ang kukuha sa voice office sa 101 Maginhawa Street o may dagdag lang na kaunti, pinakamukhang delivery charge sa buong Pilipinas, 25 pesos. Kung nais niyo pong umorder ay mag-text sa numero na nasa ating screen. Ayan, so habang bago pa sa ating mga alaala ang ating napakasayang DCBC Family Camp, please click this link at pinadala rin po ito sa atin sa text break at sa online fellowships natin. Please answer the evaluation form para mas mapainam pa ang ating um, experience sa ating camp. At sabi nga kanina na waay huli na ito na virtual camp. Sana sa susunod, face-to-face -face na ulit. Para sabay-sabay tayong kumain ng cinnamon rolls. So, yes! <laughs> yun, lang, yun po yung na-miss ko sa camp. Oh, ayan. Kuya, pa would you want to, ano, to announce this? Uh, ayun, continuing pa rin po para sa mga gustong tumulong sa campus ministry. Pero ano na po ito, more of uh, involvement sa uh, every Monday na fellowship. Tapos uh, kung meron po kayong 
opportunity makapag-lead ng small groups. Ayan, ganun na po yung ano ngayon, yung nangyayari. So, i-update natin yung announcement. Pero yun din po, tomorrow ng 3.30, ayan, may fellowship kasama ng mga taga-UP. Doon po, makikita nyo si na Caleb, ganyan, si na Glenda, pumunta po sila doon. Ayan. Ah. Opo. Ayan. Thank you, Pao. Do we have more announcements? Ayun. Oh, wala na tayong announcements. So, kung sakali lang po, dito po sa Zoom, wala tayo ngayong bisita. Puro tayo mga uh, magkakakilala na. Pero baka po sa YouTube ay meron, uh, meron pong nanonood na unang beses pa lamang. We would like to um, welcome you and send our virtual hugs. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. So, yun po, our worship service is ended, but of course, our worship continues. Thank you so much, and God bless everyone. Yay! <laughs> Can turn on your cameras now. <laughs> Hello po! Namiss ko kayo. <laughs> Hello! Ang kaya sina Monique at ano? Nasa Matt YouTube and... sila ate. Oh. Okay. Yeah, patay, patay mo na yung YouTube para sumama na sila sa Zoom. Oh, yeah. oh. Nice. Sir Nico, give me the powers. Okay, I'll give you the power. Okay. Uh, Kanin, Come join us. Kanina si Chela sumulput sandali eh. Oh, nga. 